four, three. We'll do it live. Now we're live. <laughs> Aaron Kennedy, the general craziness of it, the impact on your life. We have gone through so many stories, and we said, you know what? This should not be kept to the two of us. Hey, Megan. You know what just happened to me, Erin? Tell me what happened to you. I, I've been meaning to talk to you about this and I keep forgetting because I, I, it just slips my mind. You ever know that feeling where you're sitting somewhere and all of a sudden you're like just staring into space and you are aware of the fact that you're staring into space, but you literally just don't want to blink and you're just kind of yeah, like all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to engage at some point. That just happened to me while we were rolling the intro. Did are that used engaged? to happen to you on I the air? No. On air? No, I don't think so. Maybe during packages. Well, that's what I'm saying. And then like, you know, you're coming to the end of the package and you're like, I have to now start to blink yeah. and like re-engage. <laughs> that's when you know you have a good co-anchor is when you know they've got your back and then there would be like a little tap at your desk, like, wake up. Wake up, wake up Aaron. Uh -huh. One co-anchor who was always watching the Red Sox even during the show and it'd be like... <laughs> Pay attention. Um, we have another super duper exciting guest today who has a great storied career. And I can't wait to talk to her, Megan, because she's the whole package. And also when you look at her career, you'd be like, man, she had it all. Why'd she leave? Right. right? And so that's a common theme. We see it all the time. And I think part of like what we want to do is understand the why of it uh, mm -hmm. for people who are still in the business, people who are just curious about the business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's bring you back to her resume reel. Roll it. Roll tape. <laughs> oh, roll audio, Eric. That led them to 17-year-old Jared Kano's home. A bunch of co-workers north of the border win the lottery at just the right time. Oh. Police are always looking for innovative ways to fight crime, and here's a new one. Bye, bro. Favorite, favorite story of the there day. There it is. How far would you go for your favorite pizza? I may recall a couple of weeks ago we told you about a restaurant that was barring all Right, Megan? She's so talented. Why so does she leave TV news? So engaging, right? Like so you can engaging. feel. Let's yeah. welcome Diana Alviar. Diana, how are you? <laughs> welcome to our little show. It's good to have you. Oh, it's so good to be here. And and Megan, I, I was laughing when you were talking about um, staring off in his face because it's almost like you're having like existential moments like on set. You know, they're rolling <laughs> sports highlights and you're just like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> oh wait, yeah. I have to connect and be engaging. Oh wait, I'm here. <laughs> I definitely had those moments. It's oh so my god, half the time I was literally staring into space thinking like, what do I have to do later? What I need that at the grocery store. Oh, and yep, you know what I mean? Like well, it's that it. overnight yeah. shift. So Diana, yeah. when we were just watching your reel there, you were on ABC's World News Now, which Megan and I love because that's what yes. we would watch when we were getting ready yeah. for the local morning show. So you uh -huh. must have been up one. Oh, oh, man. Man. We, had to get, we had to get to the studio somewhere between 11 at night because then, you know, it was, you know, prepping all the materials and then doing hair and makeup, which, you know, it's like fabulous, right? Because normally you're doing your own hair and makeup um, and there they're providing it to you. The only catch is you have to be there at like 1.30 in the morning to get your hair yeah. and makeup done. Um, it was it was rough. And I actually just filled in. Uh, for a short spell in between their anchors. I was based out of Chicago at the time, and then they sent me to New York for a while to do the show. Um, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, really, it did my finale. We were joking before we started taping that I, I was always more of a morning show personality as opposed to an evening news personality. Yeah. Um, so, and, and Rob Nelson and I are still really good friends. And um, so it was, a, it was a really fun, it was a really fun gig, but it was also really, effing terrible because I was exhausted all the time. And I'm just, I'm not I'm the best when I'm uh, tired. I'm very much an emotional mess and stuff. And I think like it took me six months after I left network news to actually reset my circadian rhythms because my sleep was so off. Like it was just it was bad. And like, that's what you just get used to. It doesn't matter if you're network or you're local. It just, you know, you work the hours that you're given and mm -hmm. your body happily. just kind of has to Until, deal with it. Not happily. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about your TV trajectory and then why you did get out. Yeah. So, um, 
I'd always wanted to be a broadcast journalist. It was, I, I, I very clearly remember that my dad would watch 60 Minutes and he had the hots for Diane Sawyer. And like, the very first theme I could think of was like the tick, 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 tick. And I thought, oh my gosh, if, if I can be a broadcast journalist, I'll be somebody important and I'll do important work and I'll be respected, you know? And I think um, my friend Aditi Roy and I share a very similar story because her parents were immigrants and stuff. And so, you know, you want to make good and you want to succeed and you're willing to work any hours and any shift and, and all of that. And so um, my very first job was in MMJ in Oak, Wisconsin which I didn't even know where Wisconsin was on a map because I was from like Miami, Florida. I'm like, I don't care. I'll take it. Whatever. <laughs> 725 yeah. an hour. I lost so Quite much weight colder. because I could not afford to eat. I couldn't afford to eat. I was so skinny and so sad, but beside the point. Um, <laughs> I moved to Green Bay as a reporter and then anchored there. Um, and then from there, I went to ABC News, which was bananas, like going from that a market quick. the size of Green Bay to Chicago, the Bureau. And um, I basically white knuckled it my first year. It was really, really rough. Every single time the the um, New York area code flashed on my phone at work, I'm like, oh, I'm getting fired. Like, I literally like, did not relax for a full year because I was like, this is it. I get that. <laughs> I, I want to understand, Diana. Like, so you're you're pounding the pavement, working, doing reporting in Green Bay, Wisconsin, okay, where the mm -hmm. main story is probably the Packers or something related to the Packers every time, right? All right. So yeah. how do you feel like they saw you? Was there a moment that you covered a story that was a national story? Like, how did that happen? I, I was really, really hungry to make it. And so I, I mean, I'm, I outworked everyone. I would, you know, get to the scene faster. I would, you know, muscle my way in, my way in to get interviews. And I think it just kind of showed up in my demo tape too. Um, I, I remember I sent it out to a few agents and then um, Peter Goldberg called me and I was like, okay, cool. Let's start. And, you know, cause you don't know anything when you're at that stage, you're like, do I need an agent? What, you know, what kind of thing. I just wanted to get out of Green Bay. I wanted to go to a bigger market. I wanted to be challenged. And then um, the ABC I mean, opportunity to presented to itself. To eat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I could afford to eat finally in Green Bay. Um, but I just, you know, I was ready for something new. I was, I, I wanted, I wanted to try bigger stories and challenge myself. And then it was like a mixed blessing because, you know, on the one hand you're like, oh, you know what? Like I'm going to network, like this is my dream. This is what I've always wanted. Um, and then the flip side of that was just staggering imposter syndrome, staggering insecurity about, do I belong here? Uh, I, you know, am I am ready for this? Uh, am I going to be able to do this? Am I going to fall flat on my face? You know, you just feel so much pressure. You must be what, 20, 23, 24 at this point? Oh girl. No. <laughs> I was much older than that. I was like, 30, 31, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. But it just, I was so nervous. Like I've, I've always been, I've always been somebody who's had to scrap for what I had. And it, you know, it's just like, I didn't have that natural confidence of like, oh, I belong here. Like that, it took me a good two years to finally feel like, okay, I'm here. I'm doing a damn thing. I feel good about the work that I'm doing. I can handle it. And this was like, I mean, I was on the road constantly. I was covering like I mean, in Chicago, it was a lot of weather, so a lot of disasters. And then um, politics, I covered President Obama's campaign for a little bit. Um, I covered Governor Rod Blagojevich with the golden ticket thing. It was like crazy shit happened when I was in Chicago. Yeah. And then, and then, that, then they moved me to L.A. And L.A. was like this whole new world where I was – filing packages on Lindsay Lohan in court. Like, what am I doing with my life? Like, it was just like <laughs> this abrupt turn from like serious news in Chicago. And then all of a sudden in LA, it was like wildfires and the Oscars and like Jessica Simpson's baby weight. It was bizarre, you know, <laughs> but it was, but you it was mentioned great. You, you mentioned though, that you were like that morning personality that, right. That like happy bubbly thing that, you have about you. So 
in my mind, naturally they filter you towards LA to cover the red carpets and all this stuff. Right. But that, because that's your personality doesn't necessarily mean that's what you wanted to be covering. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was really happy in Los Angeles. I really was like, for once I was like, I, I loved where I lived. I loved my team. My, I mean, my, my brother from another mother, Chris Spitzer, and I, like, he was my, my producer, uh, about three of the four years that I was at ABC and we did everything together. Like it was, it was great. Like we had, we had a great time together, but I have to be honest right around 2010, 2011, I remember I started to just kind of feel like, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. And it was, it was so frightening to me because I, um, you know, I, I sacrificed everything to get to where I was. And then all of a sudden I had to have this little gut feeling like this hog saying, is this it? Like, or do you want to do other things? And literally the things that I wanted to do was take salsa lessons and, you know, meet a, meet a, meet a guy and maybe get a boyfriend, <laughs> um, sleep in my own bed for the next four or five nights. It was just these really simple things. Just, it felt bizarre to me. And I had like this inner conflict for a while because, you know, my one self was like, no, we worked too damn hard to get here. And you, you know, you need to make the most of this opportunity. And then the other side of me was like, yes, but I'm not happy. And, and that was rough. Like that, it was an ongoing battle for like two years. And I remember when the NBC opportunity came up, I was like, well, I have to take this because this is today show. Like this is the brass ring. This is what everybody wants. And you have to do this. I know. I mean, it's like freaking Tom Brokaw was teaching my writing workshop. Um, Right. And I was so unhappy. I was just, I was so unhappy. I remember I told myself when I signed the contract, I'm going to give it six months and see, maybe it was just that I was unhappy at ABC and and it turned out that I was just, I was done. And it's like a very frightening thing when you realize that you're burnt out because you have to have that fire to do this job. Like you have to be like, put me in coach every single day and like live for, you know, making it into, into the newscast that day and like, you know, beat everybody else. And it just, I was exhausted. And I was tired and I was lonely. And I just was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And Mm -hmm. so I remember people were just like, what? I mean, you were on the Today Show and you left. And I was like, yeah, I did. And I was like lost in the desert for like a year because I just didn't know who I was after that because I had been the one thing for so long. And then it turned out that like those jeans didn't fit anymore. And so who am I? And like that just kicked off a time where I was just trying to figure it out. And then um, I met my now husband, I had my son and I was like, okay, I'll go back to news, but I'm, I'm not going back to network. I'm going to go back to local. And I did that for a few years. And then I got pregnant with my, my daughter. And I was like, now I'm really done. Like it just, so (laughs) hours are so incompatible. That's my little girl. I have a little boy too. And um, you know, it's so incompatible with, work-life family. balance and yeah. time with your family. Yeah. And I just, yeah. you know, it was just very clear to me, especially at that age, like it, it took me that long to have the damn kids. So <laughs> I want to enjoy them. Hey, yeah, I want to enjoy them. Yeah. And then the other thing about it too, is like, it's made very clear to you. And I know you probably uh, dealt with this as a woman on air, you have an expiration date. Unless you were a superstar, it's like, you know, that, you're, you know, I was wearing Spanx every day and like, you know, so much makeup and it's just in the back of my head. Oh my God, do I have to get Botox? I was like, I just don't want to deal with this anymore. You know, I uh-huh. want something that's sustainable. It's not going to depend on me looking like I'm 35 for the rest of my life. And so, um, so that's how I ended up where I am today. You know what? You- where are you today? Tell everybody what you're doing now. Oh yeah. Um, I'm doing corporate communications with LinkedIn and it's, it's great. It's a, such a great company. I love the people I work with. Um, and I'm utilizing a lot of the skills that I honed while I was in, in news. And, and then like my side hustle is that we're doing a podcast called beyond the news and where we're essentially interviewing people who have left the business and started new, new things. And we're able to, you know, help people understand that there are opportunities beyond working in a newsroom. Cause it, it's really easy to feel like, Oh my God, this is the only thing I know how to do. What do I know that transfers to anything else? 
Oh my God. I, I a hundred percent, everything you're saying resonates with me. And I'm curious, <laughs> like I had, I had one moment in particular where I turned, actually turned down, like what would have been the younger Megan's dream job, you know? And I remember yeah. thinking to myself, I just sat there and started crying, but I didn't want it anymore. And I'm wondering like, how did you come to terms with that feeling of like, God, I could have everything I thought I wanted, but now I don't want it. And I'm real confused. <laughs> oh man, it was, it was the biggest struggle for me. It was, it was so hard. It's, I, I mean, I, I vividly remember sitting in the parking lot in Burbank at like three in the morning crying in my car. And then I would like, you know, and then go in, put on a crap ton of concealer under my eyes and do my live shot because I was just so like exhausted and, and done. And it's almost like, it's almost like like my body and my soul made the decision for me. Like they're like, yeah. um, if, if you don't make the decision, we will. And it was, it was obvious. Like I, I was just, I, I just couldn't do it. And I, it's funny because like somebody, I don't remember when this was like a year or two ago. And they're like, Oh, come on. Like if GM came back to you and was like, well, off, I would, I was like, no, I have zero desire. Like I've lived that life and packaging is amazing. Right. But then the reality of it, like I explained to somebody, like, if you see somebody on the scene of a, of a story, that means they're not at home. That means they're not making breakfast for their kids. That means they're not doing bedtime stories. That means that they're not, you know, able to run and pick up their kid if they butt their head and need to, you know, it's a, I, I just, to me, my life is so different. Like the things that fill me up are so different than what they used to be. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And I don't know what I, obviously I think it, that for many people is, is when you have kids, but yeah. for some people, it's just getting to the, I didn't have kids. That yeah, you didn't have kids, right? So it's like but you're yeah. not even to that point yet. You just got to the point where you could no longer physically, mentally, emotionally do it. But Diana, right? I right. was stalking you on LinkedIn for much longer than I actually finally reached out to invite you on here. <laughs> I thought I remembered a post where you were reporting from a natural disaster. And yeah. if I remember everything correctly, your brother said, yeah. you want to have kids someday, right? What are you doing? What was that yeah, story? Uh, yeah, it, good memory. So it was. So this was by far. Th this was a pivotal moment in my decision to leave. Us. It was. Um, I was on the ground in Japan, and you know, it's hard to imagine now, but the the plane didn't have Wi-Fi getting there. So when I left the ground in LA, like when the plane took off, it was just bad enough, but it was earthquake and a tsunami. We had no idea that there was a nuclear crisis unfolding as we were flying to Japan to cover it. We land and like my Blackberry is practically exploding because there are so many messages and I'm like, oh my God, what did I just get myself into? Yeah. And, you know, the whole facade of it is like, oh, you're, you're a tough reporter and you can handle anything and you're going to run to danger and stuff. That's, but the reality was that I was very, very scared. Like I, I was doing my best to just report through it. But I remember like they handed us this business card, business card type thing. And they were like, if the gray turns darker, let us know. And I was like, what does it mean? And they're like, cause that means that you've been exposed to radiation. And I'm like, great. Thanks. Um, How, old were you then, huh? How old were you at this point? Uh, I was in my early days. And so this was right when I was starting to have those thoughts about like, I want yeah. kids someday. Like I, you know, yeah. I was allowing myself to have these thoughts and um, I was just really uncomfortable while I was there. I was like, I don't know what's happening to me health wise. And then um, my brother texted me and my brother's a doctor and he's like, you know, he, he, he's, he's a guy. So he like, we don't text that often. He was just like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm okay. And he's like, sis, you're in your childbearing years. I just want you to keep that front of mind. And yeah. as soon as he sent me that text, like I, I started crying and I went to my producer who, uh, a different producer. And I just said, I can't stay. And I called Chris, who was not on the trip with me. And I called my other friend, Sunny, who were both at ABC. And I said, I think I'm going to ask to leave. And I said to them, I, I know I may be destroying my career by doing this because you're not allowed to say no. You're not allowed to say, I don't feel comfortable anymore covering the story. Or at the time you could it, I said, and I'm, I'm going to tell him that I want to leave. 
And I remember just being so firm, like, this is what I'm going to do. And I called my boss and to her everlasting credit, she was very understanding. And I said, I am afraid, you know, I don't want to hear anymore. I want to come home. I, I, I can't cover this anymore. And then right after that phone call, like I booked, I booked my flight, I was packing all my stuff. And then we got a note saying that everybody had to leave. I don't know what yeah. happened. I don't know what happened, but everybody this had to leave. Turned gray. So it was like, <laughs> yeah, somebody's card was gray or <laughs> pink, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, there were, there were like sizable aftershocks in the airport where like you would literally have to hold on to things because every, the ground was moving so much that you felt like you were surfing, like you were on like how a water. Were you there? So, how, how long is this, you know, going through like this? You were there from when to when till you decided I got to get out three of here. Days. Three, three days. Three days. I mean, it was, it was bananas. Yeah. I mean, there were chunks of ceiling falling on my laptop as I'm trying to type. And like, I remember I finally went to bed. I lay down and an aftershock rolled through and my bed went clear across the room and banged into the wall. And I was like, okay, I'm not sleeping. <laughs> I'm gonna get out. Oh. So it was nuts. Yeah. And I understand what you're saying because about not being able to say no. And it's, it's not like you technically, I mean, of course you can say no. You just know that when you do it, they're going to write you off as somebody who would give their every heart just and soul and it. body for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You become yeah. not as but it was a choice I made. Then. Yeah. And it was, and it's, it's funny. I'm glad you brought this up, Erin, because that really was the beginning of the end. This was where mm -hmm. I, I decided to, I chose my future instead of my present career. I chose yeah. the future that I wanted. And it was like my first act of rebellion of saying, I want something else. And it was, it didn't, you know, it didn't feel empowering at the time. It felt very scary. It felt very like, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's crazy to look at my life now. And it's, you know, I'm paddling this morning and in bed with my three-year-old and my six-year-old and, um, you know, we're having breakfast and I'm making sure that they go off with a smile. And, and I'm thinking to myself, like, Thank you to Diana from 2011, 2012, because it was those decisions that lay the groundwork for a much happier life later. Yeah. So did and you find that it was hard to untangle your ego from it though, too? Because I, you know, oh, yeah. struggle with that too, because you Me have too. this high profile job and everybody knows you and you're yeah. being sent on the best assignments and you know, you're at the number one market, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. And then to peel back, not only to pivot to doing something else, but to not know if you're going to be successful in it, to not get that same kind of recognition, it's just, yeah. it's quite an emotional journey. It is, but I think it's one of the hardest, best things I've ever dealt with was, um, I would say, reconciling the fact that um, I had to be okay with just me. You know, like there was no fancy title to come after my name. Nobody was watching me on TV anymore. I had to just be like, you know what? I am enough. And that was such a valuable lesson. And I, I talked to my, I, I mentor lots of young professionals and I tell them all the time, if there's one thing that I can teach you is that you have to believe that you are enough as you are. It's not the promotion you get or the amount of money you make or the amount of people know who you are. It's you, you know, for you, because if you of yourself and believe that you have value, then, you know, you're deeply rooted and, and any storms that come your way, you're still, you're good. You're going to be good. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. so true. And it sounds like you <laughs> had to learn that a couple times, right? <laughs> Everybody does. Like you belonged at the network first. And then you had to feel like you were good enough, not part of the network. And I think, you know, we, we all go through those journeys, but everything feels just that little bit more, I don't know, just sharp when you're doing it in front of a lot of other people too. So everybody's got that like feeling of not feeling good enough, but when you're doing it on TV and millions or thousands or however many people are watching you, it's a, it's real heightened. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And it, it felt very much like I was a public failure when I left NBC, it really did feel like I'd failed publicly and spectacularly. Um, but that, you know, honestly, people don't care that much. <laughs> like it's, that's how <laughs> you feel. Um, everybody else is like, oh, she's not in the business anymore, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, 
and and then you just make peace with it and you're just like well i'm i'm fine i didn't like go up in a puff of smoke uh and i've still got so much to offer and it's just been a really great lesson like mm -hmm. i i honestly think like i loved my career i loved my experiences i'm still so close to so many people like when you're in the trenches like that together making you know lemonade out of lemons every single day um you know, it, 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 it's so good for you, but at the same time, though, like that was part of my life. It's not my life. It was a part of my life. And now my life is it's something very different. And it's interesting. Guys, I have to go. It's it's noon and I'm supposed to be somewhere. Oh, okay. We'll have to have you on for a part two. Yes. Sure. Yes. Thank you so much for having me on um, and fitting me in with my crazy schedule. But I love what you're doing. Yes. Like there are so many crazy stories and I'll come back and be on any time. That'd thank be great. So Good. Much. And we'll so point nice everybody to, to your podcast too. Diana, thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.